Welcome to When Gen X Rolled the Multiplex, in which I cast a critical eye on the films that influenced those of us who are now in our 40s and 50s during our formative years. The biggest name in Gen X geared films during the 80s was writer-director John Hughes, the creative force behind such seminal 80s teen films as The Breakfast Club, Weird Science, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Pretty in Pink, Some Kind of Wonderful, and his 1984 directorial debut, Sixteen Candles. Sixteen Candles, along with Amy Heckerling's Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Martha Coolidge's Valley Girl, forms a bridge between what teen films were and what they'd become. Prior to Sixteen Candles, films made for teenagers were either of the hopelessly uncool ABC after-school special variety or the raunchy skin flick variety. Sixteen Candles splits the difference. It's a tacky teen sex comedy with a great deal of sympathy for the 1980s teen experience. A former contributor to the satirical National Lampoon magazine, John Hughes had already written the comedies National Lampoon's Vacation and Mr. Mom before writing and directing Sixteen Candles. That National Lampoon influence is very prevalent in Sixteen Candles, much more so than in Hughes's subsequent films. The humor of National Lampoon was smart, it was an offshoot of the legendary Harvard Lampoon, and also often hilarious. But National Lampoon's humor revolved around an upper-middle-class wasp frat boy comedic sensibility that spared no one but could be extraordinarily uncomfortable kind towards women and people of color. And if you suspect I'm pointing this out as my way of easing you towards the uncomfortable yet unavoidable conclusion that while Sixteen Candles is a very funny and often very sensitive depiction of 1980s teen angst, it is also on occasion super duper problematic, you are correct. In an upper middle class suburban neighborhood, the Baker family begins their day. Patriarch Jim Baker is played by veteran character actor Paul Dooley, while his wife Brenda is played by stage star Carlin Glynn, mother of Mary Stuart Masterson, who would star in John Hughes's Some Kind of Wonderful in 1987. Youngest daughter Sarah is played by Cinnamon Idols, while obnoxious preteen son Mike is played by Justin Henry, who holds the still current record for being the youngest ever Academy Award nominee for Kramer vs. Kramer, which was released in 1979 when he was eight. Nobody but he likes an overachiever, Justin. The Baker family is currently in chaos because adult daughter Ginny, played by Blanche Baker, daughter of screen star Carol Baker, is getting married. The family is braced for an influx of visiting relatives. Meanwhile, it's the 16th birthday of middle daughter Samantha, played by Molly Ringwald. Ringwald had spent a season on the NBC sitcom Facts of Life and was riding high on her acclaimed performance in Paul Mazursky's Tempest. Ringwald was 15 when Hughes cast her in Sixteen Candles, and the role shot her to teen super fame. She was regarded as Hughes's muse, starring in The Breakfast Club and Pretty in Pink, and became a key pop culture icon for the 80s, at one point appearing on the cover of Time magazine. Samantha is glum because turning 16 has made her life no different. She feels no closer to becoming an adult, and in the mayhem of preparations for Ginny's wedding, her entire family has forgotten that it's her birthday. At school, Samantha complains about her underwhelming life to her best friend Randy, played by Leanne Curtis, best known for starring in B-movies like 1989's wildly entertaining Girlfriend from Hell. During class, Samantha fills out a confidential sex survey given to her by another friend. From her survey answers, we learn that Samantha is still a virgin, though she'd very much like to rectify that with hunky senior Jake Ryan. Jake Ryan is played by Michael Schofling, the model-turned-actor whom we have also seen in Vision Quest, who starred in a very small handful of films in the 80s before retiring from show business to start a custom woodworking business. While Schofling never became as famous as Ringwald, Jake Ryan has come to represent a very specific kind of unattainable male teen perfection. Samantha tries to pass the completed sex survey to Randy, but Randy has fallen asleep in class. Unbeknownst to Samantha, the survey is intercepted by Jake Ryan, who becomes very curious about this random sophomore who desperately wants to have sex with him. Please note that Samantha's binder is emblazoned with the name of Pittsburgh-based rockers The Rave Ups, whose lead singer was, at the time, dating Molly Ringwald's sister. In the girls' locker room, Samantha and Randy enviously ogle Jake's prom queen girlfriend Caroline, played by Haviland Morris, who is gorgeous and popular and has a perfect body, and thus represents everything Samantha believes she herself lacks. On the school bus on the way home, Samantha is accosted by a freshman known as The Geek, real name Ted, who is played by Anthony Michael Hall, who, in the pantheon of John Hughes films, was the male equivalent of Molly Ringwald. Hall, who had appeared in National Lampoon's Vacation the previous year, would go on to star in The Breakfast Club and Weird Science. Like Ringwald, he was 15 at the time of filming, and also like Ringwald, he had a knack for infusing his characters with teen authenticity. We all knew The Geek in high school. 
some of us were the geek in high school. The geek is madly in love with Samantha, even though she's openly hostile toward him. Also on the bus is an unnamed neck brace wearing classmate played by a comedian and former SNL cast member Joan Cusack, known for films like In and Out and Working Girl. When Samantha returns home, she finds her paternal grandparents, Howard and Dorothy, played by veteran character actors Edward Andrews and Billy Bird, have moved into her bedroom. Like all the rest of the Bakers, they have forgotten Samantha's birthday, as have her other set of grandparents, Helen and Fred, who are played by Carol Clark and Max Showalter. Helen and Fred greet Samantha and embarrass her by making a big fuss over her budding breasts. Samantha tries to hide in her brother's room, but finds it occupied by Long Duck Dong, an exchange student staying with Howard and Dorothy. Long Duck Dong is played by Gede Watanabe, who would go on to appear in the 80s films Gung Ho and Vamp, and who has had a stable career in film and television ever since. I'm not the first person to point this out, but the film's treatment of Long Duck Dong is pretty appalling. There's a gong noise every time he speaks, and we're clearly meant to snicker at his broken English and his malapropisms, and Mike Baker observes that he's going to have to burn his mattress and sheet after Long Duck Dong leaves. Part of the joke here is that the Bakers are terrible people, and the film is clearly aware that they are treating Long Duck Dong badly. But that's only half the joke. The other half is that the film sees Long Duck Dong as an object of mockery because he's Asian. Lest you think this is one of those occasions where you can go, well, this seems socially unacceptable now, but opinions change over time, and this was probably fine in 1984, please note that the otherwise mostly favorable May 4th, 1984 New York Times review of Sixteen Candles specifically called out the notable on funny ethnic jokes. We knew better, and John Hughes knew better, and he went for those jokes anyway. I will say, though, that Gede Watanabe gives kind of a weirdly cool performance, and despite the film's treatment of him, you can make the argument that Long Duck Dong ultimately gets a pretty good little character arc. That evening, Samantha attends a school dance. There are moments Sixteen Candles gets exactly right about the 1980s American high school experience, and this dance is one of those moments. School dances are often depicted in 80s teen films, but with rare exceptions, they're almost always prom, or maybe homecoming something where you have to worry about finding a date, and you dress up, and you wear a corsage, and you rent a limo. And the vast majority of school dances, in my experience, were much closer to this informal school dance that Samantha attends. You don't wear anything special, you don't need a date, you might or might not do some dancing, but it's mostly a school-sanctioned occasion to hang out with your friends. The geek tells his equally geeky friends Cliff and Bryce that by the end of the evening he will have made a meaningful connection with Samantha. Cliff is played by Darren Harris, whose only other screen credits are played one of the weenies in John Hughes's Weird Science, and Geek Number 3 in Better Off Dead. A non-professional actor, he was discovered by Sixteen Candles' casting director because he was realistically awkward. Bryce is played by John Cusack, brother of Joan and star of Gross Point Blank, Tapeheads, Say Anything, High Fidelity, and many other films. The geek recklessly promises his friends he'll get his small yet sweaty hands on Samantha's underpants by the end of the night. Jake dances with Caroline while Samantha looks on longingly while Spandau Ballet's True plays. There is a great deal of music in Sixteen Candles, but with very rare exceptions, I'm not going to talk about any of it. That's because the music situation in this film is unfathomably complicated. The theatrical release of Sixteen Candles has a totally different soundtrack than the VHS release, which has a totally different soundtrack from the DVD release, and so on. Due to music rights issues, you can watch Sixteen Candles multiple times and hear a completely different soundtrack each time. But there are a couple of songs, like Spandau Ballet's True, that seem to carry over from version to version. The geek tries to grab Samantha's attention by dancing in what we're meant to view as an embarrassing manner. But it was the 80s, and as I've remarked here a couple of times before, we were all terrible dancers during that decade, and honestly, the geek's dancing is not significantly worse than anyone else at that dance. Samantha flees in humiliation, and Jake, whose interest has been piqued by the sex survey, grills the geek for information about her. Also at the dance, Long Duck Dong finds happiness in the arms of a very tall woman, whom Samantha addresses as Marlene, but is billed simply as Lumberjack and is played by Debbie Pollock. Samantha hides out in the auto shop classroom, absolutely miserable. The geek trails her, and she confesses that it's her birthday. He aggressively tries to make out with her, but beneath the obnoxious and childish exterior, he shows small signs of being an okay guy. He asks her for sex, she replies that she's saving herself for Jake Ryan, and he tells her that Jake Ryan was asking about her. 
She's delighted by this news, and in return, he asks her for a gift, her underwear. On the dance floor, Caroline is annoyed that Jake has seemed distracted all evening because he's been mooning over the random sophomore who wants to boink him. Meanwhile, in the boys' room, the geek and his friends charge freshmen a buck apiece to look at Samantha's underwear. While all this is going on, the Baker parents undergo an uncomfortable dinner with Ginny and her boorish fiancé Rudy, played by The Breakfast Club's John Kapalos, and Rudy's tacky parents. After the dance, Jake Ryan is the reluctant host of a raging party at his parents' lavish home. The party, which is of the classic 1980s pizza-on-the-turntable variety, was all Caroline's idea. She gets extremely drunk while Jake hides in his bedroom. He tries to call Samantha, but he's stymied by her overprotective grandparents. The geek, Bryce, and Cliff crash Jake's party and win the ire of some upperclassmen, while Long Duck Dong and Lumberjack get it on on an exercise bike. When Caroline drunkenly tries to spend some time with Jake, he shuts her out of his bedroom, and she gets her hair caught in his door. Her equally drunk friends Tracy, played by Elaine Wilkes, and Robin, played by Jamie Gertz, whom we have seen in Solar Babies, The Lost Boys, and Less Than Zero, rescue her by chopping off a big chunk of her hair. At the Baker home, Samantha is awakened by her father, who realizes the family forgot her birthday. She tells him about her crush on Jake, and he gives her a very sweet and heartfelt pep talk. After the party, Jake finds the geek trapped beneath his coffee table in his utterly destroyed home. The geek fixes martinis, and they chat about their respective woman troubles. Jake says he's looking for a serious girlfriend who isn't into partying, which totally explains why he's actively pursuing a sophomore he has never once spoken to, but who has privately confessed that she'd like to boink him. Jake also mentions that Caroline is passed out in his bedroom at the moment, and I could violate her ten different ways if I wanted to. The implication is that he's being very noble right now for not violating his unconscious girlfriend ten different ways. And you know what? Michael Schofling has cheekbones to die for, but as a boyfriend, Jake Ryan is utter garbage. For all of the good work Sixteen Candles does in viewing Samantha's teen angst with sensitivity, the film views Caroline as a burden that Jake needs to unload in any way possible so he can get with Samantha. Jake loans the geek his dad's Rolls Royce and tells him to take Caroline home. While Billy Idol's Rebel Yell plays, the geek drives around in the Rolls with Caroline, who is now conscious but still very, very drunk. After a long night, during which Samantha and Jake pine for each other in their respective homes, Samantha's mother apologizes to her daughter for forgetting her birthday. The entire Baker family heads to the church for Ginny's wedding. Jake shows up at the Baker home looking for Samantha, and a hungover Long Duck Dong, confused as to the identities of the Baker sisters, tells him she's at the church getting married. Ginny's period arrives unexpectedly, so she takes a handful of muscle relaxers to ease her cramping. A doped-up Ginny sways and staggers down the aisle as the church organist, played by Zelda Rubenstein, the baby-voiced psychic from Poltergeist, plays the wedding march. Caroline and the geek wake up in the front seat of Jake's dad's rolls in the parking lot of the church with no memory of the previous night. The geek asks if they had sex, and Caroline confirms it. Jake arrives at the church in his red Porsche in time to see Caroline and the geek kissing. After the wedding, Samantha finds Jake waiting for her outside the church. She blows off the reception and leaves with him. At his home, they sit on the dining room table, separated by a cake topped with 16 lit candles, and they kiss. Hopefully at some point around this time they'll have their first conversation, so they can find out if they have anything at all in common. Fittingly, for a film about the endless humiliations of being a teenager, Sixteen Candles is loaded with uncomfortable humor, and much of it works well. The business with Samantha's underwear is hilarious and almost plausible as one of those mortifying things that could only happen in high school. One of John Hughes's strengths as a screenwriter was his ability to capture the day-to-day -day indignities of being a teenager. Samantha exists in a state of perpetual embarrassment over her family and her lack of social status at school, to the extent that something as seemingly inconsequential as taking the bus home from school turns into an ordeal. In its attempts to be a raunchy teen comedy with a soul, though, Sixteen Candles makes some missteps. There's the whole matter of Long Duck Dong, plus it's hard to root for Jake Ryan as Samantha's destined soulmate when he acts like such an absolute dirtbag to his girlfriend. Sixteen Candles is a strange beast. In many ways, the film it most resembles is National Lampoon's Animal House, the all-time comedy classic from 1978. Animal House and Sixteen Candles have similar comedic sensibilities. They're both smart, chaotic films that revolve around young people behaving badly at out-of-control parties, and are filled with cheerfully offensive jokes that take no prisoners. The similarities make sense. Not only did John Hughes write for National Lampoon, but he also wrote for Delta House, a short-lived 1979 sitcom 
sitcom that was based on Animal House. But Sixteen Candles is also a very earnest and sentimental film, with an ending that is pure teen girl wish fulfillment. In his subsequent films, Hughes would distance himself from the National Lampoon influence and fully commit to that sentimental side. In Sixteen Candles, though, those two sides maintain an uneasy balance. It shouldn't work. The tonal clash between heartfelt earnestness and crude satire should be too jarring. And yet it kind of does. Sixteen Candles has remained an enduring teen classic, warts and all. Next time, Neo-Tokyo is about to explode when I look at my all-time favorite film, Katsuhiro Otobo's Akira from 1988. Until then, thank you very much for joining me, and I will meet you here later.